Hi guys, welcome back to Waxing On. It's Monday, April 19th, and Monday means jazz. And today we're going to look at a trumpet player who's been around since, I'm going to say the mid-1970s. Uh, another disciple of Dizzy Gillespie, and he's really made his mark as a session player. And I'm talking about John Faddis. Now, I've talked about John Faddis a number of times over the last year uh, as a backup and are playing sessions, uh, gigs for a lot of the albums we talked about, a lot of them out of New York. And really, to me, that's what I know him most for, is his great lead playing and section playing as backup for a lot of other artists. But I do have a couple of albums that he recorded on his own. Uh, first one being... And this was done with a small group, so it's more of a jazz thing. And this is what happens with a lot of, uh, I guess, say lead players that like to show people what else they can do. I mean, he started out, uh, like I say, following Dizzy Gillespie. Gillespie was his mentor and playing that style of music. So the, the lead playing was just something else that he was, was into. This album called Legacy. There you go. Small group. We've got uh, Mel Lewis on drums, Ray Brown on bass, Kenny Barron, and Harold Land. Now, he had, when he started out, played with uh, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis. He'd also played with Charlie Mingus, who we talked about just a few weeks ago. So, Lewis is not new to him. Ray Brown, again, an excellent West Coast bass player. Been around for years. Barron on piano, and uh, tenor saxophone was Harold Land. Give you some idea of what he was doing. We've got West End Blues, Little Jazz by Roy Eldridge, another great trumpet player. And I think we mentioned him uh, back when we were looking at the Oscar Peterson uh, section. Night in Tunisia by Gillespie. Uh, a couple of fattest tunes here. Well, one fattest tune, Instigator. Things to Come, A Child is Born by Thad Jones. Little Darling by Neil Hefty. And Whisper Not by Leonard Feather. Now, this was a pretty straight-ahead jazz album. A chance to really show what Fattis could do, other than just play high notes. Now, the other album I have, and this is where we fall into the problem, and I felt this was the same one with Doc Severinsen. We talked about, uh, I said Doc, really, his best albums were the ones he did with Tonight Show Band. Or for me, those were the best albums. And I think a lot of times, producers or somewhere in the music industry decide they've got to make these guys hip. We've got to have a little more public appeal. We make them a little rockier. We do something like, like to me, Elvis, or not Elvis, uh, Severinsen had a, a number of albums that his playing was great, but where they had him playing or, you know, the format of what he was doing didn't really appeal to me as much as the big band work. And this is what I found on Fattis, Good and Plenty. Uh, I just re-listened to it the other day, just to, you know, I'll give you some idea what we've got. We've got Tune Riding High by John Faddis, Good and Plenty by Faddis, Everything Must Change, Promenade from Pictures at an Exhibition, Western Omelette Adapted by John Faddis, Slow Walking Faddis, Razor Blade Faddis, and Baker Street, Gary Rafferty. Now, we had some guests on this album. We had Michael Brecker, Tenor Sax. Uh, Lou Soloff was in there playing trumpet, trombone David Taylor, um, baritone sax Howard Johnson. Some of these guys we mentioned before, Howard Johnson with the Saturday Night Live Band. Um, Leon Pendervast, electric piano, one of the musical uh, performers and directors on Saturday Night Live. We had John Tropia. We have uh, Steve Gadd on drums. We have a lot of players. And when I listened to the, some of the songs, the first thing that struck me was not Faddis' playing, but the way they tried to, I guess, modernize it or jazz it up. Not even jazz it up, that's not the right word because it really wasn't jazz. It was more electronic bass and electronic keyboard sound. It was like we tried to make it a little more accessible to the younger people. And to me, it kind of took away from Faddis' playing. Now... Still some great John Faddis there. And it reminds me of, um, if you remember back when we talked about Miles Davis, uh, Live at Fillmore was my first Miles Davis album. And I'll tell you, from what I've been used to listening, I just couldn't get my head around what was going on. There was just a whole new sound. 
And I can remember a lot of times taking the stereo and turning the one speaker down that had all the background people or more in the mix and listening just to the Miles side and the other guys a little further back. Because Miles was playing great, I just couldn't get my head around what was going on with the, uh, the accompaniment. And I found that with this on The Fattest Good and Plenty. I think they tried to make it more of a commercial album. Uh, it didn't have the, the truth or the honesty that Legacy had. But again, just two different sides. Maybe this is exactly what appeals to you. I'm just saying maybe I'm just too old school and I had a hard time adjusting to that one. And of course, anything Fattest plays lead with. Well, I think last week we were talking about the Gerald Wilson album where he was the lead player on that. Uh, he conducted the Carnegie Hall Jazz Orchestra for 1990s, all through that period. I mean, to me, that's where he really shines, in front of a big band or playing in a big band. The solo stuff, it's interesting, and it's nice to see the other side of John Fattis. But if I was looking to listen to him, I'm a partial for the big band. So we've got two sides of John Fattis here. The more commercial, good and plenty, and the more traditional jazz sounds, of Legacy. Both of them are available on streaming networks. Uh, feel free to check them out. Feel free to share this video, like it, uh, let your friends know, and uh, we'll see you. Let me see now. Today is Monday, Wednesday. We're looking at Classic Rock. Hope you join us. Thanks for stopping by.